Marketing touches all Canadians every day of their lives. Every morning I wake up to a Viking radio alarm clock produced in Hong Kong. I brush my teeth with Colgate, gargle with Listerine, and shower with zest. All manufactured by Canadian subsidiaries of US parent company. When I dress, I put on my Pierre Cardin shirt. Made in Canada, but licensed from France. And then, I drive to work in a Mazda. Made in Japan. At lunchtime, I'll go out and buy a t-shirt. Made in Hong Kong. The Canadians benefit from products from all over the world. Marketing is important to Canadians because of the global nature of their community. Professor Stanley Shapiro talks about the globalization of markets. Business in Canada, and I think this will be true of business all over the world, has gone through a variety of stages when it comes to its international markets. There is first of all the, the period of importing and exporting where people thought primarily in terms of perhaps having established overseas markets and perhaps just having a place where from time to time an overflow of domestic production could be distributed. Uh, that importing and exporting approach is, is still prevalent in many of the smaller firms. Uh, recent years, however, we've talked about the international business uh, movement and the global corporation, and the multinational, operating in various parts of the world, owning facilities, and converting their organizations into world organizations. And some of those corporations have a higher income stream than many nations. Um, but that e period also is coming to an end. What we're beginning to see, especially in Canada, is what we call the globalization of markets. The international marketing environment has changed greatly since 1945, creating both new opportunities and new problems. Each nation has unique features that must be grasped. A nation's readiness for different products and services and its attractiveness as a market to foreign firms depends on its economic, political, legal and cultural environment. First, Let's get a basic idea of the business scenario as it exists today in Canada. First, to the particular configuration of Canada across the northern border of the United States, a nation that runs close to 4,000 miles east to west, while the normal patterns of trade would run north to south. The size of the market some 25 million people, approximately one-tenth of the U.S. market, spread in a variety of geographic clusters, so that one finds three million people in Toronto, three million people in Montreal, a million and a half people in Vancouver. Um, language is, of course, a factor in the Canadian market. I'm not certain it is fully appreciated that approximately one-quarter of the Canadian population lives in the province of Quebec where the working language and where the official language is French. Uh, all products sold in Canada, by the way, must be labeled bilingually. Much of the Canadian manufacturing industry is controlled by foreign owners because the Canadian market is relatively small Companies that are concerned about growth will enter international markets. The first step is usually the U.S. market, roughly ten times the size of the Canadian market and with a similar social, political, 
economic and technological environment. The U.S. is Canada's main trading partner, and approximately 70% of Canada's international trade is with the United States. The Canadian-U.S. free trade agreement has also contributed in a big way towards this. Now the free trade agreement comes after considerable negotiation and debate. It was passed with the United States, and that agreement remains a subject of considerable controversy in Canada. The Reagan administration, while sounding confident, is clearly worried. As the President himself said in his final State of the Union message, America's jobs, America's growth, America's future depend on trade. Trade that is free, open, and fair. The mandate, which in fact was the na last national election in Canada, where free trade was a major issue. These people believe that this little country, 25 million people, spread over 4,000 miles, could not refuse to be part of a free trade agreement. Uh, before that agreement was negotiated, we had a common market, of course, but it was a common market of 25 million people, with many of those people closer to large markets in the United States rather than large markets in Canada. Now Canadian firms will be operating with a market of 275 million people, there will be considerable access to uh, larger markets, perhaps 250 million people in the United States live within 1,000 miles of the Canadian border. It is acknowledged that, yes, there will be some disruption in Canadian manufacturing patterns, that, uh, on the other hand, we may find some uh, American retailing establishments moving into Canada. But by and large, it's felt by the proponents of the agreement that Canada can compete, that the guaranteed access to the U.S. market more than compensates for any of the um, disturbances that will be associated uh, with the free trade agreement as it is phased in over the next decade. The distribution channel varies considerably from country to country. There are striking differences in the number and type of middlemen serving each foreign market. Professor Shapiro comments on some differences between the U.S. and the Canadian trade, their distribution systems, financial markets, and other business issues. Canada is very, very concentrated in terms of a limited number of large retailers controlling the market. Three department store chains do 50% of all the department store business in this country. Canadian retailing, interestingly enough, is far more concentrated than U.S. retailing. Similarities there are, of course, in, in, in dress, in values, in behavior, in family structure, uh, but there are also uh, significant differences. One that comes to mind if you were selling educational materials is that uh, there's no such thing as a private university in Canada. They are all state-supported. Uh, even ones like McGill, with its international reputation, um, is in fact now essentially a government institution. Now, I've given a few specific illustrations, but if we were to look at um, any particular market, we would find it to be probably more concentrated than the United States. We would find a banking system where the banks have more autonomy and more authority than their U.S. counterparts. This all comes together for me when each year um, I look at the marketing text which I have prepared, which involves a Canadianization of an American textbook. There are things we have to change. Um, there are similarities. Our French market, in many respects, uh, because of the language difference, uh, dealing with it is not that different from dealing with the approximately 10% of the U.S. population which has Spanish as a mother tongue. Now, these are not all that complex. They're not as complex as a would-be U.S. Uh, exporter looking at the market in India. But uh, they reflect my belief that countries do differ and that while one can consider the of international campaigns that are the same in all developed countries, we must pay attention to the differences in each nat nation as well as the similarities. One might ask whether international marketing, particularly for Canadian firms, involves any new principles. 
Obviously, the principles of setting marketing objectives, choosing target markets, marketing positions, marketing mixes, and marketing control remain the same all over the world. The principles are not new, but the differences between nations can be so great that the international marketer needs to understand foreign environments and institutions. He needs to be prepared to revise the most basic assumptions about how people respond to marketing stimuli. Certainly, from the Canadian perspective, we felt it essential to be guaranteed access to a large market. In our particular case, two-thirds of our foreign trade is with the United States. Importing, exporting, a uh, little bit of both, where sometimes uh, parts are sent to Canada for further fabricating and then sent back to the United States. Two-thirds of the trade is with uh, the United States. Another 10% is with Japan. And perhaps in total, uh, another 10% with the member countries of what Europe 1992 will be. Um, but obviously there is going to be a tremendous impact I think these will be very important. I think that countries will have to come up with a sort of national exporting and importing strategy to adjust for the existence of these trade blocks. The increasing international trade has posed some peculiar problems relating to trade restrictions, protection policy, the availability of foreign currency and its exchange rate against other currency, and so on. The business representatives from various parts of the world started getting together in search of a forum where they could meet each other and discuss these business, socio-political matters and communicate their views and form policy. The most important of which is the European Economic Community, EEC, also known as the Common Market. The EEC's members are the major West European nations and they are striving to reduce tariffs and other restrictions which will expand employment and investment within the community. The other notable economic communities are Latin American Free Trade Association, LAFTA, the Central American Common Market, CACM, the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, CMEA, form for the East European countries, and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Canadians are showing business interest today in the Pacific Rim countries, which have become important for various reasons. The kind of products manufactured by Pacific Rim countries are increasingly adapted to international marketing or global markets. So it is becoming a phenomenon that countries like Korea, Japan, Thailand and Hong Kong do not launch some products in their domestic market, but tend to straight away launch them in the international market, where they are readily accepted and absorbed. Professor Shapiro elaborates. I think we obviously look and see the nations of the, of the Pacific Rim, Japan, Korea, Formosa, Thailand and in, in Southeast Asia, and of course the tremendous and, and large part untapped potential of India. Um, but uh, in terms of what's going to happen, um, I think really two things. Uh, the Canadian exports will in large part continue to be raw materials, wheat in particular, uh, forest products, uh, whether in the form of lumber or in pulp, and generally um, semi-processed and unprocessed materials. Um, I think this trade will prove to be increasingly important, but what I really think the implication is going to be the impact on Canadian manufacturing and, of course, on Canadian marketers. For my part of Canada, however, it is uh, Pacific Rim countries, Southeast Asia, South Asia, we're given our geographic location. I would like to see a British Columbia government would like to see increased trade patterns. I, to answer your question more precisely, I think these will be very important. 
I think that countries will have to come up with a sort of national exporting and importing strategy to adjust for the existence of these trade blocks. It isn't a question of a certain larger Canadian firms expanding abroad or trying to get a world product mandate from their parent company. We find that firms from all over the world are becoming a major factor in the Canadian market that um, you cannot, you do not produce television sets in Canada. These are all done overseas up till quite recently in Japan and now in areas of uh, uh, the Pacific Rim and Southeast Asia where labor costs are lower. That firms that are shipping from overseas are studying their consumers and analyzing uh, their methods of doing business just the same as the competitor down the street had traditionally done so. Similar to domestic trade, cultural factors affect and play a vital role in international trade. Companies that operate in one or more foreign markets must decide how much, if at all, to adapt their marketing mix to local conditions. Professor Shapiro cites an interesting example of a typical Canadian market where a mix of French and English culture influenced the market and the use of products in a big way. English and French Canadian households consume certain products, whether these products be uh, salads, whether these products be, uh, one common example is uh, uh, powdered soup being used in one re very widely in English Canada, but not in French Canada because of cultural factors. Each country has its own folkways, norms and taboos. The way foreign buyers think about and use certain products must be checked out by the seller before planning their marketing programs. Here is a sampling of some of the surprises in the consumer market. The average Frenchman uses almost twice as many cosmetics and beauty aids as does his wife. The Germans and the French eat more packaged spaghetti than the Italians. Even industrial buying styles vary tremendously. South Americans are accustomed to talking business in close physical proximity with other persons. In fact, almost nose to nose. The Canadian business executive retreats, but the South American pursues, and both end up being offended. In face-to-face -face communication, the Japanese rarely say no 
to a business executive. The Canadians are frustrated and don't know where they stand. The Canadians come to the point quickly, whereas the Japanese find this offensive. In Muslim countries, it is not proper to give anyone anything with your left hand. In fact, if you hand a person a pen with your left hand to sign a contract, he might not do it. Advertising also varies in minor ways, such as changing the colors, which might be taboo in certain countries. I noticed just recently that the Gillette Razor Company is now going to be launching a, a new product, or actually a new shaving system, in 14 uh, developed countries using the same advertising campaign, the same appeals, the same promotional strategies. But there's another school of thought that feels that um, this is happening too fast and going too far too quickly. That it may indeed be an acceptable course of action for Western Europe uh, and for Japan and even for the very large middle and upper middle class sectors of India. But I, among others, am very hesitant to, to see this adopted without adequate attention being paid to local consumer characteristics, cultural factors, and the like. I would say that the, the question of globalization in terms of marketing campaigns is, is still an unresolved issue. The, the question of globalization as far as multinationals competing against each other in the various parts of the world, that, that's another factor. I think that we will indeed see companies doing their marketing planning on a global basis. Now, let's see some advertising campaigns, and you can find out for yourself the subtle creative intentions of the marketer. เชลท็อกซ์อัลฟาเชลท็อกซ์สูตรใหม่เพชรแรงกว่าเก่ากลิ่นเบาเชลท็อกซ์อัลฟาค่ายุง <coughs> <เชลทอกส์อัลฟา, ข้ายุงและมะแรงในบ้านเรือน. coughs> It's moments like these you need, Mindy's.
ผู้ชมสวยสนาของโลเบิร์ตซ่อนเครื่องยนต์พลังจากแรงจนคุณนึกไม่ถึงโลเบิร์ตหนึ่งจุดหกหนึ่งจุดแปดและหนึ่งจุดแปดจากนิสันเพื่อนที่แสนดีแต่ตาเรียบร้อยมืออาชีพอย่างเขาไม่เคยลืมของคู่ชีพมอลาดีเอ็กซ์น้ำมันเครื่องที่ได้รับมาตรฐาน API ของอเมริกาผมใช้อย่างนี้มากสิมีแต่ใช้มอลาดีเอ็กซ์ดีหรือเปลือแล้วมอลาดใส่พลังแรงจับให้เครื่องหยุดผู้ชีพของเหนืออาชีพยอดน้ำมันเครื่องมอลาเอชดีและดีเอ็กซ์ Media availability varies from country to country. Commercial TV time is available for one hour every evening in Germany, and advertisers must buy time months in advance. In Sweden, commercial TV time is non-existent. Commercial radio is non-existent in France and Scandinavia. While magazines are a major medium in Italy, they are a minor one in Austria. Advertising media is a particular problem because if you're going to advertise in Canada, you have the problems of what is known as spillover advertising from the United States. In my home in Vancouver, just a few miles from the U.S. border. I can receive both Canadian and U.S. television stations. That being the case, it is very costly for a Canadian-based manufacturer to reach enough people, enough times, to have the same effect that manufacturer would have if you didn't have to worry about this spillover advertising. Uh, we have to talk about Canadian demographics, the aging population, the uh, the law as it affects. Um, Uh, what it is advertising can do vis-a-vis -vis, um, advertising to children or the representation of women in the media. The international marketing business scenario is getting complex day by day. A company may export to one country, license in another, have a joint ownership venture in a third, and own a subsidiary in a fourth. In Canada, as foreign companies successfully invade the domestic market, Canadian companies will have to move more aggressively into foreign markets. They will have to evolve from ethnocentric companies treating their foreign operations as secondary to geocentric companies where they will view the entire world as a single market. This will lead to globalization of business. 